Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, this beautiful morning this summer. I am Kathy Greenlee. I am the Assistant Secretary for Aging, as well as the Administrator, the Administration for Community Living. I am so glad that you could join us. As I look at the audience, I see many, many faces that I am familiar with, many of you who I know advocate every single day on behalf of our nation's seniors. So I want to thank you for what you do every day, but thank you for joining us here this morning as we focus specifically on seniors' health and opportunities under the Affordable Care Act. So thank you all for joining us. I would like to acknowledge the White House and the White House staff who've helped us uh, put this together at Health and Human Services. We have a wonderful partnership and are glad to be able to bring this event uh, together with you. We have a number of people in the audience this morning, but we are also uh, video casting this online. So you will likely hear from us questions that come from the audience who are watching online and tweeting their questions. So we will hopefully get some tweets that come in. Those of you who um, can access your Twitter accounts are certainly welcome to send questions that way. But we will also take questions from the audience. The hashtag that we use for those of you who want to send a tweet is uh, Seniors Health. Seniors Health is the one to use. And I have had the opportunity to do a Twitter event before on seniors' issues. We often get way more questions than we can answer. We'll do our best to be responsive, but also we'll try to follow up for those of you if we don't get to your specific questions. We have a wonderful presentation or uh, group of panelists with you this morning, and I want to just kind of go down the row and tell you uh, who's here with us. Uh, on, on the end is Jonathan Blum. Jonathan is the Deputy Administrator and director of the Center of Medicare at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Next to him is Jim Furman. Jim is the president and CEO of the National Council on Aging. Jim also currently serves as chair of the Leadership Council of Aging Organizations. Next to him is Sandy Markwood. Sandy is the CEO of the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging. And on the end, Dr. Louise Chang, who's with the senior, she is the senior medical editor, editor for WebMD. So we have a very fine panel for you today. Uh, we're hoping that, the perp that this event this morning can help us further the conversation about seniors and their health needs. And I wanted to start by just sharing with you an experience that I had a couple of months ago. Uh, as you may know, March 23rd was the two-year anniversary of the Affordable Care Act. And that week, on the 19th specifically, I had the chance to do a similar event in Albuquerque, New Mexico, with seniors directly at a senior center. And I felt like the seniors that morning provided us a real good example of the range of questions that seniors have, but also the different type of seniors that we serve. So I wanted to briefly tell you who was there that morning. In Albuquerque on that Monday, there were a number of seniors who had recently retired. And they were quite active. They had a lot of questions. And what they wanted to know is, how can we help get the word out about the Affordable Care Act? How can we make sure that seniors know what's available? And they are ready and willing to mobilize with us to talk about the Afford Affordable Care Act. And so we need to work with uh, those individuals who can be good partners for seniors. There were other seniors that morning who had slightly different questions. Their questions were much more about themselves and their own concerns. What is the coverage gap that we know as the donut hole? How does the Affordable Care Act help me? What can I do? And what are these new preventative services? And their questions, this other group of seniors, were also more broad. How does this help my family? How does the Affordable Care Act help my grandchildren? And then there was a third group of seniors. And they're less active, more quiet, because they were more frail. Uh, I had a staff person with me that morning who whispered to me later. She said, you know, I think that one woman just got out of the hospital. And for that group of seniors, we need to talk about the Affordable Care Act in the way that it strengthens Medicare. The Medicare is critically important for seniors. We need to talk about our efforts to crack down on fraud, to extend the life of the Medicare Trust Fund, to keep Medicare safe so it's there for the seniors now who need it, but all of us who hope to become seniors and join this fine group of people we represent. We hope today that we can generate questions and, and answers along that full range from the strength of Medicare to the new opportunities, but also how Medicare and the Affordable Care Act changes in specific are helping all of our nation's seniors as well as their families. So my honor uh, to next turn this over to uh, a wonderful uh, guest that we have with us this morning from the White House, uh, Cecilia Munoz. And I would like to be able to um, introduce Cecilia to you. Cecilia Munoz is the director of the Domestic Policy Council, which coordinates the domestic policy making process in the White House. 
Prior to this role, she served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Director of Intergovernmental Affairs, where she oversaw the Obama administration's relationship with state and local governments. Before joining the Obama administration, Cecilia served as Senior Vice President for the Office of Research, Advocacy, and Legislation at the National Council of La Raza, NCLR, which is the nation's largest Latino civil rights organization. She supervised NCLR's policy staff covering a wide variety of issues of importance to Latinos, including civil rights, employment, poverty, farm worker issues, education, health, housing, and immigration. Her particular area of expertise is immigration policy, which she covered at NCLR for 20 years. Please help me in welcoming Ms. Munoz this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the White House. It's really, we're so excited to have you here. Um, and I, we're looking forward to a really interesting exchange. And um, what I appreciate the most about the exchanges that we've been having uh, on the Affordable Care Act is how much we learn from them and how much uh, we are guided by um, seeing the world as you see it, seeing the implications of this law as you see it, knowing what you know, and making sure that. Uh, we're gathering the information that you presented to the process because it's, uh, it was instrumental in helping us develop the law. It's instrumental in helping us implement the law. Um, this is incredibly important uh, feedback for us. So thank you so much for taking the time to help, help guide our work. Um, this administration is working very hard to protect the health of seniors. Um, and we know that today 49 million people rely on Medicare for the medical treatments, the, pres the prescription drugs that they need to get healthy and to stay healthy. Um, and one of the top priorities of this administration is to protect the Medicare program and ensure that it will be there for the current generation but for future generations of seniors. Um, and so as part of these efforts, the President has made it a priority to make sure that we're uh, fighting Medicare fraud as a major priority. And that's what I'm going to focus on a little bit in my remarks this morning. Um, this is something which takes essentially resources out of the pockets of seniors, out of the pockets of taxpayers, uh, and also fundamentally weakens the program. This is why it's a priority. And fortunately, our efforts to fight fraud in the program are making a real difference. Uh, we have more than quadrupled the number of anti-fraud uh, strike force teams that are operating around the country. And the number of individuals that have been charged with criminal health care fraud has increased from about 800 in the year before the president took office to more than 1,400 last year. Um, and the Affordable Care Act has given us powerful new tools to support these efforts. Um, using technology that's similar to what credit card companies use, we can identify and stop sus suspicious payments before they go out when there are credible allegations of fraud. And we can keep bad actors out of the Medicare program in the first place through a tougher screening process that targets the areas, the sectors where we see the most fraud. Um, we see the fight against fraud as fundamental to our efforts to strengthen and protect the Medicare program um, and make sure that it's as strong as possible for the future. And according to Medicare experts, the Affordable Care Act, include, including some of its key anti-fraud provisions, has extended the life of the Medicare Trust Fund by eight years to 2024. So that's progress that's moving us in the right direction. Um, so we are committed to continuing to strengthen the program and getting the criminals out of our health care system so that we can ensure that seniors and other vulnerable citizens across the nation will have access to high quality, affordable health care that they need, that they deserve, that they've earned. Um, so with that, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. And it falls to me the honor of uh, introducing our wonderful Secretary of Health and Human Services. She was the insurance commissioner of the state of Kansas before she became the governor of the state of Kansas. And she knows the health care system from every angle. And she has been a forceful advocate for the health needs of Americans for the Affordable Care Act. We are incredibly lucky to have her as our Secretary of Health and Human Services. Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Kathleen Sebelius. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Cecilia, not only for those nice comments, but for the great work you do as head of the Domestic Policy Council. I want to recognize and thank our panel members uh, for being a part of this discussion today. And two of our great health leaders at HHS are here, John Blum, who many of you know, who runs 
the Medicare program and is, I can tell you, a tenacious and tireless advocate on behalf of the 48 million beneficiaries who rely on those services. And Kathy Greenlee, who serves uh, now in kind of a dual capacity as the Assistant Secretary on Aging, but also is taking on a new role as the head of the new Administration on Community Living. Um, I've known Kathy for a long time. We work together in Kansas. Um, she uh, is incredibly well suited for this job, and it's great to have a chance to um, be with all of you today. Um, you know, Medicare has now been in place for about 50 years, uh, since 1965, um, and it really changed the lives of seniors in this country. I don't think there, that can be um, overstated. Uh, the, it served as a promise that seniors and persons with disabilities um, wouldn't lose their life savings, uh, wouldn't lose their houses, wouldn't lose their kids' inheritance if they got sick. And they would be able to access benefits that they needed when they needed them. Um, over the past few decades, I think, Medicaid has made very good on that promise. We have about 48 million Americans relying on that program, and 11,000 baby boomers a day become eligible for Medicare. We have the biggest um, group ever in the history of this country coming in on a daily basis as the baby boomers age. And as you've just heard Cecilia mention, um, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, Medicare is stronger than ever. Before the law was passed two years ago and signed into law, there were gaps in Medicare coverage um, that we're working to fill. Now, while the addition of the Part D Medicare benefit was hugely important uh, for lots of seniors, it was, uh, I would say, um, written with a design flaw so that the seniors who took and relied most heavily on medications ran out of their insurance coverage at some point during the year and ran into the so-called donut hole. Um, so one of the issues that the Affordable Care Act addresses is the closing of that gap in coverage, the donut hole coverage. And um, we know that up until uh, this past year, about one in four seniors reported skipping doses, cutting pills in half, not filling prescriptions at all, um, which is, in the long run, uh, far more costly to not only a patient's health, but to the healthcare system itself, because they're more likely to be hospitalized, they're more likely to be vulnerable to acute situations. Um, but that's the only choice they had when you ran out of money. Seniors also found critical and potentially life-saving preventive services like mammograms, colon cancer screenings, often out of reach due to copays and deductibles. Um, but those gaps are currently being closed. Now, seniors who hit the donut hole uh, this year in 2012 are receiving a 50% discount on their brand name drugs, and that will over time close entirely. But what we know is a little bit of a snapshot that since 2010, when the health care law was signed, over 5 million beneficiaries have saved an average of $635 each. That's real money in people's pockets and has enabled uh, their resources to go a lot further. Um, more importantly, they are filling prescriptions they may have otherwise skipped, and the savings to those seniors will continue to grow every year. And at the same time, as you all know, the law has now made recommended preventive services available with no copay and no deductible. And while that sounds like a modest change, I can't tell you how many people we talk to who say, I won't worry anymore about if there's money in the checkbook to cover this. Also, what we know is that that information is getting around to seniors. We have about 14 and a half million beneficiaries who have already taken advantage of some of those free preventive tests and screenings. One additional feature is an annual wellness visit. Now, while you had a welcome to Medicare annual visit included as part of the program, an annual wellness visit was not included for seniors. And if you think about keeping people healthy in the first place, developing a health care plan with a primary care provider, and then following up on that plan, 
is a great way to, again, keep folks healthy. Um, the law doesn't stop there. We have begun to change payment systems so it's easier for doctors to work together to deliver the kind of high quality coordinated patient care that we know is available in the country's leading health systems. And even with those benefits being added, the Medicare premiums have fallen or remain lower than projected over the last two years. Uh, for example, we know that premiums in Medicare Advantage plans have fallen an average of 7% between 2011 and 2012, while enrollment continues to go up. And that's in part because of the historic waste and fraud efforts you heard about from Cecilia, and it's in part because John Blum and his team have done some great job using the negotiating power for Medicare Advantage that they were given as part of the Affordable Care Act and the directives that they were given. So we have found that market not only to be robust, but also yield to competition. So when you add savings in the law, we are projecting that the Medicare beneficiaries will save about $4,200 over the next nine years. And those seniors with high drug costs could save up to $16,000, again, a big step forward. So unlike some recent proposals floating around Congress uh, that would actually destroy the Medicare program as we know it and shift to a defined contribution away from defined benefits, the Affordable Care Act really maintains the guaranteed benefits that seniors count on today. Um, I just came from a weekend visit with my 91-year-old father and my 92-year-old aunt. And so when I think about Medicare, I start with them and know how much they rely on this program. My dad was actually in the United States Congress sitting on the Energy and Commerce Committee when Medicare was written. And I can tell you he is happy that that law passed at the time that it did and now is a thankful beneficiary. Um, but there are lots of seniors uh, and those with disabilities around the country who are just as dependent on those critical benefits. What we're determined to do is make sure that Medicare is stronger than ever, that seniors will have benefits, lower prescription costs, and more affordable preventive care, and that their children and grandchildren will have a stronger Medicare in the future. Um, again, I appreciate you being part of this important conversation today. Um, we look forward to your input and your ideas and strategies about how we move forward together. And now I'd like to turn over the program back to Kathy Greenlee. Thank you very much. It's always good to have the secretary with us. So. We really do want this to be audience participation, and for those of you watching at home, be sure and send in your questions uh, at Seniors Health if you have questions. We also have two people who have uh, microphones who can help with your questions, so they will spread out, and uh, we'll be able to do questions and answers. Let, let me start and uh, kick things off and get you all warmed up this morning by uh, starting with Dr. Chang. And as I mentioned, Dr. Chang is the senior medical editor with WebMD. Dr. Chang, what are, the, what are the most common questions, or could you start us off with a good kind of question that uh, comes up quite often for you with your audience? Sure. Um, first, I'd just like to thank you for inviting WebMD to this special event. As both a physician and patient advocate, um, I look forward to being part of today's conversation. Um, as you know, WebMD has a very engaged online and mobile audience, and we've had many of our users uh, tell us about problems they've had finding a primary care physician given the growing shortage of primary care doctors and the increasing number of those doctors who are no longer accepting patients um, on Medicare and Medicaid. Um, we have one story from a pharmacist who told us about a woman with multiple medical problems literally going through a phone book trying to find a doctor who would accept her as a patient and she was not able to find one. And another comment comes from a WebMD user named Catherine who says that her inability to find a good primary care doctor um, is putting her health at risk. So on behalf of the WebMD users, um, my first question is, how will concerns about access to doctors be addressed by the Affordable Care Act? Do you want to? I think as the Secretary talked about, um, the Affordable Care Act uh, gives 
uh, the agency tremendous new tools to think about payment changes and other reforms to help uh, physicians work more closely with uh, their patients. Uh, we have the new Accountable Care Organization uh, program that started this year, um, really trying to um, promote better care coordination, better care delivery throughout the country, uh, very much modeled on the best delivery uh, systems across the country. Uh, so we're trying to change how we think about uh, services um, and to uh, promote more primary care, more primary care interaction. Um, in addition to the accountable care model, we're also promoting much stronger systems for, for uh, primary care for all the senior population within the Medicare program. So a real strong goal is to make sure that care is better coordinated, um, more integrated, and to, uh, to increase the patient experience um, for physicians and uh, their patients. Let me give a second one to Dr. Chang, and then an audience, are you ready? As I'm coming to you, see if you have questions. So. Sure. Um, the WebMD network includes Medscape, uh, the leading online provider of information for physicians and other health professionals. And this question was raised by one of our primary care advisors at Medscape um, on behalf of many patients who were concerned about rising health care costs. The question goes, baby boomers can expect to live longer but at a cost. They can also expect to develop conditions including Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart failure, cancer, um, and other heart disease kidney disease, um, and many of these conditions can now be treated with lifelonging but often very expensive procedures, devices, and drugs. Given this huge patient population, how can any health care system, public or private, support the trillions of dollars these treatments will cost? Sure. I think from our perspective at CMS, it's a multi-factor approach. Um, one approach it, is to make sure that care is safer and, and more coordinated and, and to take out the waste when care is not coordinated. The second, as the Secretary talked about, is to ensure um, that we're doing everything we can to take out fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, and the third is just to make sure that we're vigilantly managing the benefits that we um, pay for. Um, we have put in place new competitive payment models for certain services. We have put in place new payment ways to, uh, to ensure that uh, we're paying as accurately as possible to make sure that the Medicare program is as modern as possible. And we're already seeing very good results so far. Um, the last couple of years, we've seen very um, modest growth to the overall Medicare program, which tells us that if we really uh, focus on fraud, we focus on better care coordination, make sure that care is safer, uh, to ensure that we are uh, overseeing the payment systems very, uh, very forthright, that, that, that this very modest growth can continue for some, for some time to come. Thank you, John. Uh, we have questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to just kind of go back and forth across the room, so Carol, if you will help us with one. And it, it is helpful for people if we use the mic. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Um, I'm Brenda Sulik with the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. And as some of you know, we have an initiative at our organization called Patients Aware, we, where we are working with healthcare providers uh, throughout the country and going into uh, places where seniors are and educating them about the Affordable Care Act. Um, so I have two questions. One is um, data is really important. As we tell folks, you know, you can save, people are saving over $635 with Part D and why this is important. Um, I haven't found any information specifically on preventive care and services. I know millions of people have taken advantage of this, but I, I wondered first if there's any data that would give us an idea of how much a person saves on average since that it's been put into place, the law. Let me, let me, can I add a question to your question yes. while we go? Because um, I think we're going to give John a break, but he's going to answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not just the data, but the, but the take-up rate, because I think one yeah. of the issues that comes up in, um, in the, the senior advocacy community is how best to uh, talk about this benefit. And I know one of the things that we've been concerned about uh, is that we have all populations take advantage of the Medicare preventative benefits, that this uh, can be a, a real issue where we need to talk to all communities. Uh, you know, health disparities are real, and we want to make sure that, that everyone gets to take advantage. So, John, what's, what's out there that CMS might have, both in terms of the question on savings, but also um, the uptake at this point on the preventive benefit? Well, I think that um, 
that the savings varies by the, by the beneficiary. Each beneficiary has their own unique spending needs. So depending on um, his or her needs, there's going to be more savings, um, 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 particularly with pharmacy costs. So those that have the highest pharmacy costs will benefit most uh, from the coverage gap changes um, that went into place uh, a couple of years ago. Um, but the savings come from several sources. One is uh, lower premiums. So both the Part B and Part D premiums right now are um, lower than projected. Uh, we have the new wellness visit that's free to uh, Medicare beneficiaries that we're encouraging all beneficiaries to take advantage of. Uh, preventive benefits that are recommended um, now are free cost sharing uh, for those beneficiaries that choose to take advantage of those services. For those beneficiaries who are in the private side of Medicare, the um, uh, uh, private plan side premiums have fallen over the last two years uh, tremendously. So the savings will vary by beneficiary depending where they're, um, uh, how they receive services, their own, uh, their own care needs. Um, but our goal is to make sure that the trust funds um, are preserved, but that also produces savings to the beneficiary because beneficiaries pay through um, premiums, through cost sharing, and so as the trust funds do better, so do beneficiaries. If I could just add, I mean, we were in just coming out of really our first full year of, of, of implementation, which is part of the reason that we don't have precise specifics as to how much individuals are saving as a result of access to preventive care. We do know that significant numbers of seniors have accessed their first wellness visit without having co-pays or co-insurance. But I, I would like to thank you for the work that you're doing in conducting outreach and helping educate folks because the the many benefits of this law, the access to preventive care without co-pays and co-insurance, um, uh, and the, the, the other protections for patients are, frankly, only as good as people's awareness of them. So in, in order for the law to be successful, I mean, it sort of hinges on the notion that if you can provide preventive care to people successfully, then you really, you avert other costs in the future. We're trying to get away from the model um, in, in which people receive medical care really when a situation has become an emergency. Um, which is both obviously not good for their health, but obviously uh, also uh, has huge cost implications. So part of part of our effort and part of the reason that this partnership is so important is that is that our job also includes making sure that people understand what's available to them under this new law, so that they can access it for both for the sake of their health, but also because that's how we're driving people's costs down. So I might take this opportunity to also um, ask Jim and Sandy uh, questions along this line with regard to preventative benefits, because I know both of you and your um, your members and affiliates uh, have been working on this issue. What are you What are you doing in terms of outreach on the preventative benefit, and what are you hearing uh, in terms of other issues that we need to be aware of? Uh, thank you, Kathy. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, to begin to reinforce the point that's been made is that our, our research shows that most seniors still don't know what's in the law. Uh, they uh, do not realize uh, all of the good things it does, not only in terms of strengthening benefits, most of them don't realize that the law extended the solvency of the Medicare program for eight years, which is a fundamental concern for everybody. So we have to remember that we have to keep educating people. Uh, people, uh, only not enough people are using the preventive benefits, uh, and part of it becoming more aware of it. The, the wellness benefit is something that seniors don't realize. You don't talk to your doctor, you don't have to get undressed, it's just a conversation about what you can do to stay healthy, but not enough seniors are taking advantage of it. So we are working with thousands of community organizations uh, across the country, private and, and public, to educate seniors uh, about the law, also to educate them about extra help that's available to uh, cover almost all of prescription drug costs or some of the Medicare savings program. So our main message is that, as, as Cecilia said, this is a really good benefit, but you have to use it to, to uh, maximize the opportunity. Thank you, Jim. Sandy? Thank you, Kathy, and, and I'd like to echo Jim's comments. Uh, through the Area Agency on Aging Network, the state units, and also all of the service providers in the Aging Network, getting the word out about all of the values of the Affordable Care Act has been one of our major priorities. But as Jim said, we've got a long way to go. 
In looking at that, I think that we have opportunities through the open enrollment through Medicare Part D to expand that into telling uh, the older adult population and their caregivers about the value of the preventative benefits. I think that we need to use, as an aging advocacy community, every opportunity we can to ensure that older adults, Medicare beneficiaries, understand how valuable these preventative benefits are and how critical they are to looking at at ensuring their health. When you're looking at the, 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 the three-part aim, better health, better um, care, and lower cost, it, it really is embodied in all of the benefits in the, in the Affordable Care Act. Thank you. Do we have a question from this side of the room? Good morning, Christine Sequenzia Titus with the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists. We know that consultant pharmacists save a significant amount of money through drug regimen reviews in long-term care facilities, and we wonder how you see their role developing in the interdisciplinary team as the ACA progresses. I think that, um, that one clear goal for the Affordable Care Act it, is to make sure that we um, build stronger care coordination activities, that we link the benefits uh, much more closely together with um, uh, uh, hospital benefits, physician benefits, pharmacy benefits, long-term care benefits. Th that we know that when providers um, practice in teams, that care is safer, that care is better coordinated. So a lot of the changes that are in the Affordable Care Act really are around uh, to ensure that um, health care is more integrated, that, that benefits are, are brought together. Uh, for example, with the wellness visit, one of the elements it, is to have the physician review uh, the the, the, the pharmacy medications each year to ensure there's no harmful interactions, and, and that's consistent to, to, to how we want care practice throughout the healthcare delivery system, be it in the physician office setting, the long-term care facility, really to make sure um, that, that we avoid um, bad bad interactions with, with medications, that pharmacies um, pharmacy benefits are, are, are used to keep people healthy for longer periods of time. But that's really the goal that's throughout the Affordable Care Act, it, is to ensure that data, that interaction, that care coordination is throughout the entire health care delivery system. Let's check in with Julia. Do you have any online that you want to chime in with? So we have one question um, from Twitter, and it says, what are you doing to protect home health benefits? Say that again. What are you doing to protect home health benefits? This question came in from Twitter. We um, believe that um, that we can provide care at uh, different health care settings um, and, and that not all care has to be provided within the hospital setting or the nursing home setting. Um, so throughout both the Medicare programs, Medicaid programs, a huge emphasis is, is to help beneficiaries return uh, home to the community uh, faster. Uh, that can happen in, in part by um, home health being much more strongly integrated uh, with uh, the overall benefit, we want to make sure that beneficiaries don't have to return to the hospital when they don't need to. That's not good for the beneficiary. That's not good for health care costs. And really, we're trying to put in place new strategies uh, to help beneficiaries stay home, stay in the community, uh, so they can be happier and be closer to their families. We're doing that through uh, various mechanisms of uh, building more accountable care, health care systems that really take a, a more complete picture of, of patient care. Um, but, but one strategy that we have to reduce overall costs is to make sure that beneficiaries don't come back into the hospital or that that can be managed much more effectively where they want to be, uh, where they want to receive care through to their own homes. All right, it, it might, I might also tell you a lot of, another thing that many people don't realize is that the, the law strengthened the Medicaid provision to provide incentives to more states to provide in-home services as opposed to institutional services. This is a, a significant uh, step forward because that's where people want care wherever possible in their own homes. Dr. Chang, you, you told me you have um, plenty of questions, so I, I want to chime back in with you. Please. I do. Um, this question comes from a WebMD community member named Dave, who's a caregiver of a father with Alzheimer's disease diagnosed last year. And he says, I am the responsible party and have finally found him an excellent assisted living facility. But assisted living facilities are private pay only and no health insurance plan covers the costs, which can be quite high. 
two-part two question. Will assisted living facilities ever be covered under any health insurance plan? And will the fees for an assisted living facility ever be considered a tax credit rather than a deduction? So I might start on this and then, um, and then we can just kind of chime in if other people have, have questions. I mean, the, the underlying question is what is the best way to pay for assisted living? Uh, you know, long-term care, as the people in the room know, as the people watching know, is a huge expense for older adults. Um, the primary source for payment for long-term care expenses is someone's own resources at this point. Uh, in this country, the second most common way to pay for long-term care is through Medicaid. Uh, the Medicaid program is designed to cover nursing home care, uh, not assisted living, but a skilled nursing home, which is by definition a higher level of acuity, higher level of care. Uh, the states will provide um, home and community-based services for Medicaid, and it's just situational depending on the, um, the particular state and how uh, the program is designed. I think it's most common that individuals can receive home and community-based services on Medicaid in an assisted living facility, but that's the services, and the main cost and part of the largest expense in assisted living is the basic rent and kind of the room and board aspect, and that's really not the... Um, sort of the reach of the Medicaid program. Uh, so we continue to work, uh, kind of, I think, more broadly with the uh, senior community to plan for long-term care, to look at what the options are for other kinds of services uh, that can be purchased in the community, uh, but also support uh, people as they you know, progress and have higher needs. Uh, there are expansions in the Medicaid program that Jim mentioned, greater incentives for states to rebalance their long-term care system, to continue to provide additional waiver services. But someone who is not Medicaid eligible, who has Alzheimer's, and often Alzheimer's can be uh, supported in an assisted living facility first before skilled care, that will primarily be um, someone's own resources unless they have long-term care insurance that could cover it. All right, let's check in with the audience. We've got, okay, we're gonna come back over here, okay. Good morning, I'm Sarah Locke from ARP. I understand that the provisions in the Affordable Care Act that help fight against elder abuse, could any of the panelists talk about some of those? This is one of my favorite topics, so um, we'll now spend the rest of the hour. <laughs> um, you know, the, the advocates for um, the issue of elder abuse um, work for about 10 years. Um, and trying to get the Elder Justice Act passed uh, before in front of Congress. The Elder Justice Act did pass as a part of the F Affordable Care Act, and this was celebrated as a great victory, uh, as it should be, uh, that um, the advocates have really raised the issue of elder abuse, which many of us feel is decades behind the issues of domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse. Uh, so this was um, a good victory, but an incomplete one. Uh, because when the Affordable Care Act was passed, there was uh, authorizing language, but not appropriations for the Elder Justice Act. Uh, for the past two years in a row, the President has recommended that the Administration on Aging, now the Administration for Community Living as well, receive appropriations to begin to implement the Elder Justice Act. So we will continue to raise this issue, to move forward on this issue, uh, both with regard to the opportunities uh, that were brought to us by the Elder Justice Act, but the Assistant Secretary has a broader responsibility beyond the Elder Justice Act. Uh, the Older Americans Act has always been broad enough uh, in responsibility and charge to make sure that we, as, an, as a network, really as a nation, uh, work on this issue. And so we are looking for additional partners, additional opportunities, and certainly rely on the broader aging network. Uh, we have an increasing numbers of seniors uh, coming. Uh, we all know about the age wave. And with more seniors is more abuse just based on data. So, um, so thank you for raising. I don't know if any of our other partners want to address it. Uh, yes, uh, NCOA was proud to be part of the coalition that finally got the Elder Justice Act in, into law. And uh, now we do believe that's important to appropriate funding. We've heard from the Secretary of HHS how, much, how well the investment in fighting fraud and abuse in the Medicare program is paying off. And now we need to invest in preventing fraud and abuse among older individuals because they are the victim uh, and it's a tremendous cost of, to society. So we're halfway there, but this is a great piece of legislation, but more people need to speak out uh, in, in support of it. 
Well, and I would like to echo the fact that we need to get it funded. Um, because when you look at the statistics from the NASWID survey with the economic downturn, there's been a rise in, uh, in calls and, and instances of APS. Uh, and also what we find through the elder care locator, when we have more and more older adults and caregivers calling in, well, we've got more calls about fiduciary abuse where actually banks are referring older adults to call us because the incidences of fiduciary abuse are on the rise too. So if we ever needed to be able to get this act funded, it's now. So when I opened earlier, I, I talked about that one of the beauties of this particular event is the joint partnership between the White House and Health and Human Services. On the topic of elder abuse, we also have leadership from both. Uh, as I mentioned, the President has put this uh, in the budget for us the last two years. We do have the White House's commitment and interest uh, on the topic of elder abuse, as well as the Secretary. So we have support. We all, I think, need to continue to raise this as an issue, uh, do what we can uh, wherever we work on whatever issues. Uh, but we do have leadership and support here. So, Sally, I don't know if you have any more. Yeah, let me just echo that. You, this is absolutely a partnership, and this is an important priority. It's something that the White House will continue to advance along with the department. Um, but it does just call into question the fact that the, the conversation that's happening about the federal budget is very, very relevant because we're in a very sort of a very fundamental debate where, uh, frankly, there is a, a budget that's been, been proposed on the other side of the aisle, which really decimates a lot of the priorities that this president is trying to advance. And so, um, it, you know, in order to be successful, uh, we have to be successful also in the, in the broader conversation about where, where the government's resources go. Um, and so that's obviously something that we're very deeply engaged in. It is part of the fight, not just on elder abuse, but on education, on health care, broadly speaking, on, a, on you know, the kinds of investments that we're trying to make in order to build and grow the economy. Um, and so the, these questions are connected, and this is another area where this partnership is important in order to uh, advance these incredibly important priorities, we have to be successful in the debate on the budget. Okay, what about, I know there are several over here on this side, so Carol, pick someone who looks articulate, ready for a good question. Uh, good morning, uh, Charlie Sabatino, uh, the Director of the Commission on Law and Aging at the American Bar Association. Um, what, one of the practices that we not, now know makes a positive difference for seniors is advanced care plan especially for seniors with advanced care needs, and especially if done at the primary care level on a recurring basis. It ensures people's wishes are known and followed. It avoids care that's unwanted and often very costly. And it improves their, their assessment of the quality of care. But one of the casualties in the debate over the Affordable Care Act was uh, the coverage of, uh, of voluntary advanced care planning uh, because of the um, hysteria over, over death panels. And there was some hope uh, that it would be included in the regulations for uh, the annual wellness exam, uh, but that faltered uh, also. So my question is this, what, what are the prospects for, advance, uh, for enhancing uh, advanced care planning uh, for seniors under Medicare uh, in the future? John, could I broaden this a bit and talk about um, this is a financing question in terms of payment, but also the policy question of the broader conversation about how we continue to support seniors in their, their own planning, uh, which is something that the Aging Network can also partner with CMS to do. I, mean, I think from our um, perspective, our goal is um, really to make sure that patients have much stronger relationships with their physicians, um, that there is more time to, uh, to make sure that physicians are uh, understanding their beneficiaries' needs and uh, desires. And so from my perspective, the Affordable Care Act really uh, puts in place a lot more uh, uh, time and ability for, for physicians to have uh, much stronger uh, relationships, particularly primary care, with their patients. So everything that we're trying to do kind of in the wonky payment reform notion, be it ACOs or medical homes or other kinds of, of um, payment changes, really to our mind is about making sure that patients have much stronger relationships with their own physicians, they have more time, they have uh, more knowledge uh, to how patients want to receive their care. And, and to me, this is the best way that we can to ensure that the program is as strong as possible, not just from a trust fund financing perspective, but more important for, for, how, for how beneficiaries receive their care. 
Uh, this is uh, an example of, of something that shouldn't just be left up to government, uh, that individuals in the private sector, uh, nonprofit organizations need to make their views known. Uh, fundamentally, it's a no-brainer that every person on Medicare should fill out an, an advanced directive. Even if you say, I want everything uh, that's possible to give to me, which is one extreme, make your wishes known. The point is, if you are not explicit, you will eventually find yourself in a situation where somebody other than you is deciding what care you get and don't get. So we at NCOA are, are proud to be part of a coalition for advanced care that many uh, leading groups are part of because we and the private sector need to get the word out through our network and everybody listening today should realize this is something you should do for yourself and for your family, whatever your preferences are. Sandy, do you have anything to add? Well, Kathy, thank you. I think that, um, as you said, I think right now the aging network is, uh, and one of the benefits of the Affordable Care Act is the opportunities through care coordination and also the care transition program to actually serve as that bridge between the medical community and the individual, the patient at home. And recognizing that health care and health decisions don't end when you walk out of a hospital door, they don't end when you walk out of the medical office, and actually trying to have conversations and coaching and to empower the patient and the caregiver to be able to ask the physician, the dispatch planner, all of those important questions that are key and critical to the quality of their health. Julia, how are we doing online? Do you have? Okay. So this question uh, came in through Facebook from Aaron, who said, I'd love to hear more about what HHS is doing under the Affordable Care Act to ensure quality outcomes for seniors leaving the hospital and leaving rehabilitative stays in nursing homes. There are a lot, there's a lot that can be done to reduce readmissions, preventable infections, and accidents. This is a broad question. I may be able to hand the mic to every single person going down um, the line because, so thank you, thank the person, <clears throat> excuse me, who sent that in on Facebook. So let me start and turn it over to, to John and, and have our, our partners weigh in. Um, when, when we saw this conversation as the Affordable Care Act was being debated, the issue about hospital readmission, uh, the way I characterized it was it was two conversations in one. One was about payment methodologies. How do we make sure that there's not a financial incentive for a hospital to have someone go home prematurely or have a financial incentive to have them come back in prematurely? The other half of the conversation was, what can we do to help them once they're home? And it's been on that part that we have been focused through the Administration on Aging since the Affordable Care Act passed. Uh, we saw the community care transitions program that's coming through the Center for Innovations out of CMS to be a tremendous opportunity for the Aging Services Network. We have a, a process now, or an opportunity now, to take good evidence, good practice on care transitions and implement it around the nation and, and find the right type of partnership between the medical community and the, and the community providers who have been doing similar work for decades, which is how best to help someone stay home and get the supports that they need. Uh, so we have been uh, working to work with our network to learn evidence-based practices, uh, to encourage them to um, participate and, and seek funding opportunities from CMS, and really be able to highlight that that's a special and very fragile time for individuals, for seniors, uh, when they move from one setting to another, particularly from a hospital to home or from a hospital to a nursing home, and that we all can be there collectively to find a better way to support them. There will be people who um, need more, need medical supports at home as well, but certainly the community, I think, has a large role to play, and we've been uh, excited by the opportunities that the Affordable Care Act has brought us the last two years. So, John. Um, the, uh, the first thing that we know is that quality varies tremendously across the country and that um, different beneficiaries have different experiences with the healthcare system depending on which part of the country that they live in. So part of our work and our goal is to make sure that we elevate the overall quality of care throughout the country and, and to ensure that all Medicare beneficiaries have the best possible care 
uh, no matter where they live. Um, we, we know that some beneficiaries have very complicated conditions and have to use the hospital frequently, and the Affordable Care Act does nothing to take away um, uh, those, those needs and, and those benefits. But at the same time, we also know that many beneficiaries prefer not to have to go back to the hospital, not to um, have to go back into the nursing home, to, to stay in their home, to stay in their community. We know that some systems, you know, transition beneficiary is much better than others. So the first thing that we're doing is to post data to make sure that, that we have the information transparent to everybody in the country so they can see how their local hospitals fare, how their local health care systems fare, to spurn the conversation. What does it take to keep beneficiaries home longer periods of time and in, and in safer care transitions? Over time, we're also shifting that data to payment incentives so hospitals that do a, a better job will have higher reimbursement or really incentivize the system to really take care of patients, to understand what they need, to understand um, what they prefer, and have payment incentives tied to those, um, those, um, those, those results. So really to our uh, work and the Affordable Care's work it, is that in order to keep the program strong, to keep it working best for beneficiaries, we have to elevate the quality. Part of that is to better manage the care transitions for beneficiaries, and that's in part will come for better data, more transparency, um, but also paying for results. All right. I think this is another example of how the innovations in the Affordable Care Act will lead to better care. Speaking on behalf of, you know, many of the hundreds and thousands of community organizations we work with, they're particularly excited about these provisions because under the system, Medicare will be paying for the right thing, which is to keep people uh, from being coming back to the hospital. And when, what we know about when people are discharged from the hospital and they wind up coming back, it's usually because they're dehydrated, or they're not eating properly, or they're not taking their medicine, or, or they fall. And those are all things that we know community organizations, by working in partnership with hospitals, can figure out effective strategies. So I think this is going to be one of the things over the next few years that's really going to show up in the quality of care for older adults. Many fewer of them will be readmitted to hospitals when they don't need to be. Well, and in saying that, um, with the 3026 section of the Affordable Care Act and the funding announcements that have come out, I really think that the aging network has stepped up and shown that they want to be partners with the medical community. Um, and in looking at that, making those partnerships broader than just the hospitals, bringing in physician groups, bringing in the pharmacies, and recognizing that there's a whole cadre of medical systems experts who can come into play. But again, focusing on what you said, Kathy, is that it's also the home and community-based service delivery system. When you look at those one in five Medicare beneficiaries who return to the hospital for a preventable readmission, the research shows that 40 to 50 percent of those readmissions are not due because of lack of medical care, it's because they don't have access to those key and critical home and community-based services. So Jim, like you said, how do you make sure that somebody gets that assessment, they get that meal, they get transportation for that follow up doctor's visit, they get chore services, they get those critical things that really can make a difference. And I think in just a, less than a year, what we're finding through those program announcements is that we are bending those, those the readmission and 5%, 15%, and that translates into dollars, but as importantly for those older adults and their caregivers, that translates to quality of life. So, Louise, since we're down there, you're in the table. Are, are, there, are there questions that have come up along the same kind of topic with your members? Because there was so much conversation about hospital discharge and readmission. I'm wondering uh, if, if there are more things uh, along that line that you all would have comments or questions about. Well, there were comments. Um, there have been comments um, about frustrations in being discharged and, say, not being able to get the prescriptions filled you know, upon discharge or a delay um, in getting that kind of care. Um, support at home and that kind of thing. Um, you know, with it's not like in the olden days where your family was 
immediately, always, you always had family around. Um, the support networks have changed now. You might have uh, your adult children living far away from you, and so um, there's definitely been um, discussions about that kind of frustration. Um, but it sounds like, you know, a coordinated effort's really involved in, in dialogue between the medical community, social work, mm -hmm. um, and other agencies, in addition to the patient and their, you know, true mm -hmm. support network uh, will benefit the most. Uh, let me go back to the audience, because over here it seemed like we had quite a few questions, and then I won't forget people over here on my right. Thanks. My name is Camille, and I'm from OUT. And I have a question. Wait, will you say your name again so people know Camille it? Camille Brown, and I'm OUT. Older Women's League? Just older. want to make sure everybody <laughs> online knows who the Older Women's League is. So thank you. OUT. Um, and my question has to do with the expanded workforce. Uh, healthcare workforce in terms of uh, geriatric care physicians and mm -hmm. other healthcare workers, uh, does the Affordable Care Act contain any funding to train new physicians uh, to address the needs of midlife and older women and uh, just uh, the older population uh, yeah, in general? Because you know, as you as you all know, the uh, the older population is growing. Yes, the Affordable Care Act does designate money specifically for geriatric. Geri education, geriatric Education Centers. It's our sister agency, HRSA, the Health Resources Service Administration, which is a sister agency to both ACL and CMS over the Department of Health and Human Services, that was specifically designated money as a part of the Affordable Care Act to do outreach on geriatric education, both in geriatric education centers as well as to talk about geriatrics to a broader provider uh, population. I don't know if it's not, it's not something that John and I either one do directly, but that has been the primary lead agency within Health and Human Services. Uh, I also know that the Affordable Care Act uh, it beefs up training for community health workers and other provisions, recognizing that the health care system of the future is in addition to better trained physicians, it's more community-based uh, providers who understand how to coordinate care and help people uh, stay healthy. So it, this helps to position the workforce. For example, there's a prediction that we're going to need two million jobs in the home care field over the next 10 10 to 15 years, and so make, making sure that uh, we're training people, including older adults, who can be very good workers in this field is, is one of our priorities as well. And just to build on that, the, um, the administration's commitment to community health centers, both under the Affordable Care Act, but also under the Recovery Act before it, has already expanded community health centers' capacity by three million people, that they, an additional three million people that they're able to serve each year, and um, that we've just made another series of grants to expand the population served by, by over another million. And in many cases, this means actually physically expanding the facilities of the community health centers. So that's, um, uh, Jim is absolutely right that this is a big part of the commitment to our sort of vision for care is to make sure that we're really maximizing, um, and you know, not just people's coverage, but actually the av availability to care, particularly in harder to serve communities. Well, and in following up on that, because of the expansion of the community health centers more and more, and Kathy, you and, and the regional offices have been working on this, is again, bringing together the community health centers with the aging network and, and the opportunities there to then broaden that scope and reach to older adults at the community level and their caregivers. So if I can connect this back up to Camille's question, you can see that it's all interrelated that there are opportunities um, for, through HRSA, kind of on the, on the private side, so to speak, through educational opportunities, educational partners, universities, geriatric um, education centers. But also, we know through the community health centers that they're serving an increasing older population. And for the first time this year, HRSA has a, a contract in place to provide technical assistance to the federally qualified health centers about serving an older population. So as, as this very well-informed audience would know, there are times that we need to focus specifically on additional geriatrics uh, in terms of training, but also we need to talk to the providers who are seeing increasing numbers of seniors and make sure that they also receive competencies and training in the field of aging uh, as well. And I think we've had the opportunity uh, through the Affordable Care Act, both in kind of the, the federally qualified centers and the geriatric education centers to kind of reach this from both directions. Other questions? I think, let me go over here because I know there's some. Yes, hi, uh, good morning. My name is Rich Wahlberg. I'm the administrator 
of uh, Minera Park Center for Senior Living in Beachwood, Cleveland, Ohio. Very honored to be here today. Minera Park is one of the largest senior care communities, uh, nonprofit faith-based in the United States, and we're also a five-star Medicare-rated facility. Um, I want to share a positive compliment about the Affordable Care Act and then shoot to my question. I always think it's always good when you get in front of a group to share about how the Affordable Care Act touches uh, the needs of the human beings, the individuals. I spoke on Friday. I told uh, one of the ladies we served who's an outpatient therapy client, 58 years of age, disabled on Medicare. Her husband, back in 2009, died of a heart attack. Her son was killed tragically in a car accident and we see her for outpatient therapy. And she said to me when I spoke to her on Friday, told her about this conference today, the town hall, and the question I'll get to in a second, she said, she said, Mrs. Schwalberg, um, before the Affordable Care Act, I was spending $500 a month on my medications, and I couldn't put food on my table, and um, I would cut my heart pills, my um, uh, depression pills, um, my diabetes pills, uh, my asthma medication, I would take it every three, four days. I would hold back, uh, you know, the end of the month because I couldn't afford food on my table and to pay my rent. And she said, after the Affordable Care Act, the special thing is it went down to $200 a month and she could now afford food on the table back in 2010. She got that rebate in 2010 through the act. So um, she really wanted to express appreciation. I always think it's nice to share a, a special story as a, as a provider who touches uh, about 1,400 elderly and disabled people a day in Cleveland, Ohio. My question, which she was raising, and, and other folks on our campus throughout the country raising, is through the act, somebody like this would benefit through um, case management services. Of course, seeing under the wellness benefit a doctor once a year or so, but a nurse, a social worker who she could call on once, twice, three, four, five times a year, through like a Medicare home health benefit, to help tie together her medication issues, her food issues, her medical issues. And I'm wondering through the Affordable Care Act whether that's being considered to be expanded, the services of uh, limited services on a regular basis of a case manager type person under Medicare or whether it's something that you're gonna be looking at in the future. Thank you. Well, uh, I think one of the things that we know is that when care is better coordinated, when care is better quality, um, that it's a very frequent touch that beneficiaries have with their care provider, not necessarily their physician, but a nurse practitioner working in the physician's office or a kind of a, a community outreach um, uh, person to make sure the beneficiary is taking his or her medication that he or she has enough food uh, to, to keep them healthy. We know that when beneficiaries follow their medication regimes, they stay healthier for longer periods of time when they have uh, sufficient food. So we're doing a lot of, of different strategies to ensure that we have that much more frequent touch with with beneficiaries. One strategy is to build stronger medical homes where we can you know, have not just a primary care physician but an entire team uh, identifying beneficiaries who are in most uh, uh, most fragile condition that can use um, um, you know, more frequent contact with their care provider. For example, for beneficiaries who have a high rate going back to the hospital, we want health plans and, and care providers to, to, to actively outreach to those beneficiaries to make sure they have everything in their home to keep them safe and healthy and, and they don't have a risk of falling, for example. So it's not just one benefit, but a whole host of, of different strategies uh, to make sure that our healthcare system um, is much more responsive uh, to those day-to-day -day needs and, and to identify beneficiaries early so it's not when they come to the hospital that, that, that the care intervention starts. Thank you. More questions? I want to make sure we get to as many in the audience as possible. Hello, my name is Rachel Goldberg. I'm from B'nai B'rith International. And um, I think everyone here probably recognizes a fundamental truth, which is that healthy aging can't realistically start at age 65. I know there were efforts in the Affordable Care Act to address what we see, which is lots of people between, let's say, 55 and 65 who are unemployed, underemployed, uninsured, or underinsured for one reason or another, and insurance in the private market has historically been inaccessible or unaffordable or 
um, astronomically expensive. I wanted to know um, how the efforts in the Affordable Care Act to address that, how things are going. Do you want to do any of this? Yeah, I mean, sort of broadly speaking, this is was one of the points. When the Affordable Care Act comes online in 2014, the goal is for people to have access to affordable care through these through the exchanges that are coming online. So we are, you know, working full tilt with the states that are setting up exchanges. Um, and as, as I'm sure you know, when in, in the case of a state which doesn't set up a health care exchange, the federal government will have an exchange available. Uh, but the idea is to maximize access for everybody across the country in the system to make sure that they have coverage, to make sure that it's affordable, and then to make sure that this panoply of protections that we've talked about with respect to preventive care, with respect to not having lifetime limits, with respect to coverage if you have a pre-existing condition. Right now, for example, children with pre-existing conditions can get access to coverage, and by 2014 that will be true of adults as well. Insurers won't be able to discriminate against them. All of that will be in place by 2014 for, this, for, for, for the very population of which you speak. Uh, two points, yes, we absolutely agree getting care to people before they're on Medicare is, is essential for keeping people healthy, but you know, there's this sort of myth that seniors only care about themselves, and, and I think one of the things we're hearing is that seniors are seeing the benefits of the Affordable Care Act and their coverage for their grandchildren. You know, I have two uh, children in their 20s with serious health issues who would not have been covered if it wasn't for the, uh, the changes in the Affordable Care Act. And so uh, grandparents are seeing the benefits of coverage for their grandchildren now, and then maybe many of their children will see when some of the new provisions come in the Exchange Act. So this is a, a family uh, uh, law that, that affects not just older people, but entire families. I just want to, I'm going to ask another question, just acknowledge um, that, and this has come up in a couple of the questions, that we, when we talk about Medicare, we generally talk about seniors, but there are millions of people who are not seniors, younger people with disabilities who are also accessing Medicare, and the benefits in the Affordable Care Act are available to anyone on Medicare, so the preventative services benefits, someone over here talked about someone who was 58 on Medicare. Uh, that all these benefits are a Medicare benefit, not a senior benefit, and so they can uh, apply uh, equally uh, to a younger disabled population that very much needs this benefit. Um, yes, let's go down to the, uh, Carol, can you get the first one? I'm not gonna forget you're over here. Yes, good morning. My name is Josephus Allison, and I'm Director of Higher Education and Health IT Implementation for the Consortium of Historical Black Colleges and Universities and uh, Metro Data. Um, one of the, the questions, I have two questions, basically. Primarily is that uh, I work with providers and seniors in hard to serve communities, especially around the communities of historical black colleges. And one of the things that we, we are finding is that when the five year plan and the annual wellness visit is built for seniors, many of the seniors don't understand that plan. And they're left with a plan that they're not executing because they don't understand the plan. The question is, how can we continue to do the uh, work with seniors once that five-year plan is built to make sure that they connect with a physician or to make sure that the follow-up is done? Because many of our seniors do not have access to physicians. They don't go to the physicians if they do have access. And so they don't really do a whole lot in that program. So when we go out, we make sure that we don't only tell them about the annual wellness, but we bring the medical community to perform the annual wellness visit. And the second question I have is the worst question in my mind. How will the Supreme Court decision impact seniors based on where we are today, or do we have to re-educate all over again? Let's start with Cecilia on the second question, and then maybe both Jim and Sandy and John. Uh, on the outreach question. So we continue to believe that we are on a very strong legal footing with respect to the Affordable Care Act. So we are um, continuing, you know, we're, we're working very hard every day to implement this law. And we are, you know, on schedule, on track for full implementation by 2014. So our assumption is we're gonna go forward and we're doing, you know, believe me when I tell you we have a lot on our plate every day to make sure that that happens. I will say that the implications of, uh, you know, just in general, this is just, you know, just, empirically true, uh, the implications if the Affordable Care Act were to go away have to do with all of these protections that we're talking about, access to preventive care, protections for people with pre-existing conditions, young people being able to remain on their 
parents' plans until the age of 26. All of those protections are tremendously important, tremendously popular, and most of them are in place now and affecting people by the millions now. Um, the, you know, the provisions with respect to the donut hole, the rebates to seniors for their prescription drugs. Um, these are terribly important uh, to people's lives uh, now. And so just as we have this conversation and we continue this conversation about the Affordable Care Act, again, it's important that people understand this is what's at stake here. This is what we have already won for the American people, for seniors around this country. Now, and this administration is deeply committed to them. So, and Jim, just a reminder of the first question. So seniors take advantage of the wellness visit, get a plan. How do we make sure that they have the support to follow through? Yeah. Well, one of the uh, uh, provisions of the law, provisions that we really are excited about, is the emphasis of the, uh, the law on uh, promoting evidence-based self-management. It's a recognition that the future of health care is is in part what doctors tell you to do, but it's more about how well patients become empowered to be active patients, to eat right, to uh, take the right medications at the right time, to exercise properly, uh, and to not quit smoking if, if they do that. And this law has great provision promoting evidence-based self-management programs. For example, we've worked with uh, community organizations throughout the country, the Administration on Aging and Sandy groups to help over 100,000 people learn basic self-management skills. And let me give you one vignette of a joke. Joe Jose Ketting from Maui, uh, Hawaii, who recently had a severe stroke, actually in November 2010, and his quality of life was terrible and he had really had no hope for the future. Uh, prior to his stroke, he didn't take his medications that had been prescribed, he never questioned his doctors, and he didn't pay attention to his diet. But then he enrolled in a community workshop series called Better Choices, Better Health, and he realized that he was taking medications that work, were working against each other and that he was getting uh, incorrect advice from some of his doctors. So he credits this program with teaching him how to cope with the challenges he faces to better manage his health. His wife, Lara, claims that the program uh, thanks the program for giving her man back, the man who she had married for 40 years. So what this is about is we have to recognize that the future of health care is encouraging, empowering uh, older adults to take charge. It's going to maybe less of a problem for baby boomers because we're used to trying, wanting to be in charge, but people have to take over the health and realize they're at the center of managing their health care and then make sure the doctors and other people can help them. This is a fundamental shift that HHS has recognized as a key to met for people with multiple chronic conditions, and I think this is something that the Affordable Care Act is really pushing forward rapidly. Over 100,000 people were helped in the last 18 months, and we hope to scale that to millions in the next few years. Thank you. I keep promising this group I'm coming back over here, so mm -hmm. I mean, now they're, fighting over they're fighting over them. Stand together and ask them in unison. There we go. Okay. Good morning, I'm Dennis Streets, and I'm director of the North Carolina Division of Aging and Adult Services. First of all, I just wanted to echo the earlier comments about the importance of addressing the uh, elder abuse, uh, particularly adult protective services. Um, my question really, though, is I'm excited uh, from North Carolina in, in being able to be among those working back with CMS around the improving the care of the persons who are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and we've talked about the importance of the health care home, the chronic disease self-management, um, the home and community services, and so on, and transitional care. Two other areas I wonder if you could comment a little bit about. One is the behavioral and mental health, uh, as well as um, uh, health technology, and what part they may play. So I think uh, one area that we're working very hard this year, to, uh, working with states, is ways to better integrate uh, the care for those beneficiaries who are eligible for both the Medicare and Medicaid programs. And if you think about the current health care system, it is very siloed. We have hospitals, we have physicians, we have nursing homes, and, and one goal is to bring that into more of a seamless system. The same is true, or more true, for those who are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. And our goal is to make sure those beneficiaries working with states have a, a much more integrated and seamless benefit set that, that includes the, the hospital physician benefits, prescription, long-term care, and, and behavioral health. And right now, many beneficiaries who fall into uh, this group have several benefit cards. They have to navigate very complicated rules between Medicare and Medicaid, which doesn't make sense for the healthcare system. 
doesn't make sense for the beneficiary. So working with states, we're, we're putting into place new models um, that will really create this, this seamless um, benefit uh, uh, package to make sure that caregivers and, and beneficiaries can make smart decisions for what's in the best interest of the beneficiary, not just what the silos of care will pay for. Um, but going to your second question about health IT, um, really this is an uh, area that we think the entire healthcare system needs more information, beneficiaries need more information, providers need more information. Uh, we know that quality again varies dramatically by uh, part of the country, cost varies, um, who beneficiaries are that could benefit more from just more active home-based approach. Um, so data is crucial to all of that, making sure that um, pharmacy, inter pharmacy interactions are best managed. So our healthcare system, it, 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 you probably know better than anyone, has been, you know, been, been hindered by a lack of data information that's now changing to make sure that we're sharing our data with the care, uh, uh, care providers and m making all this information much more transparent so we can see care improvements. Okay, let me check in with Julie and see how we're doing online. I have a fear of you having dozens and dozens of questions we, we wanted questions. to yeah. um, So the first one comes from Twitter and it says, can you address efforts to make insurance more affordable for people over 50? We touched on that a little bit. Do you all have um, anything else that we, we need to talk about? I mean, we talked about the exchanges, I don't know if there's... Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, the fun, fundamental goal here is um, for folks of any age, age range to be able to participate in the system, to be able to have access to insurance that's affordable. That's really what's going to be in place when these exchanges come online. And the, the um, you can get a taste, at least for what it's like going to feel like to use a system to get into an exchange by going on, on healthcare.gov, which what that does right now is um, aggregate... Uh, the, what's available to you, if you're in the market for health insurance now, it gives you for the first time the basis to make sort of an apples to apples comparison between plans without having to sort of do all the research yourself and go uh, finding out what each plan has to offer and sort of figure out how to assess, you know, this one has a higher deductible, but this one has these co-pays, like what's going to work out the best for me in the end. Um, uh, healthcare.gov is actually a very powerful way to help you just uh, assess what your needs are put in information about your circumstances and then get a sense of what your options are. And of course, again, once we're on the other side of 2014 and we have exchanges available, you'll have that kind of system, but ultimately the options will be better and ultimately we're driving the cost curve down so that uh, the, the, the whole point of this is to make sure that healthcare is both accessible and affordable and that the protections that we've talked about are available to everyone in this country of any age. Dr. Chang, can I go to you next and then I'm going to come back over on, on this side if Carol, I'll come back to you. Sure. Um, just to build on to that, uh, the last question. So for beneficiaries with low to moderate income who may have Medicare or private health insurance but still have high out-of-pocket costs, in the meantime, under understanding that the donut hole is closing, um, the gap is closing, how, what can they do now? I'm going to talk about that. I think a couple things. Um, one is that we, um, through our uh, CMS website, for example, um, help beneficiaries identify how to get lower cost um, prescription drugs, for example, when they can uh, safely substitute a, a, a brand name drug from a generic for a generic in order to have that conversation with their physician. Um, so really what we want to do is to provide more information uh, to help beneficiaries understand there are new benefits that work to lower their costs and also know that from our perspective that, that we're trying to uh, keep the overall costs um, uh, growth rate low for the Medicare program, which preserves the program, but it also lowers premiums, cost sharings for beneficiaries. Um, but for those beneficiaries who feel um, they're having difficulty paying for their benefits today, they should call the toll-free numbers that we operate, 1-800-MEDICARE, for example, or um, 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 those for other partners, because chances are there are programs that exist um, to, help, to help beneficiaries save, uh, save money. 
Sandy, uh, do you, let me, let me go to Sandy if I can, sure. Jim, just. Well, and in saying that, I think that um, through the state health insurance programs and the area agencies on aging are really helping to ensure that people get connected to the right um, Medicare Part D plans. And also, again, and I know, Jim, I want to turn to you because in looking at assessing people and um, for all of their benefits needs, because generally if somebody can't make their Medicare payments and, and benefits, there are other things that they can't make the benefits to as well. And looking at the local level, working through the area agencies on aging, the providers, and, and Jim, you need to talk about the benefits checkup program, is finding out what people um, qualify for and then making sure, just knowing what you qualify for is usually not enough. You need, really need to help walk people through um, actually applying for the benefits that they need and can receive. Jim, will you do benefits checkup briefly? I want to try to get a couple more questions in, but this is an important program that you have. So, I want to uh, Yeah, so the bottom line is that old people on older adults are missing out on $25 billion a year at three benefits. The Medicare uh, limited uh, income subsidy, which pays for 95% of your drug costs if you need it, the Medicare Savings Program, which increases your Social Security check by $100 a month, plus coverage your co-pays and deductibles, and then the Supplemental Nutrition and Assistance Program, which on average provides $119 a month for seniors to pay for food, and only one out of three seniors who are eligible for it are getting it. So if people are in need, they can go to benefitscheckup.org. It's a website uh, uh, supported by the federal government and by private sources. And you, it's a one-stop shop, confidential, fast and free to learn about all the benefits you're eligible for. But if you know seniors who are hurting, as Sandy said, there probably is a solution. We're just not connecting people to them. Thank you. Okay, back over on this side. Hi, I'm Anita Rosen from uh, the American Society on Aging, and I'd just like to follow up on uh, something that was mentioned a little earlier, and that had to do with behavioral health. Um, uh, depression, um, anxiety are very costly uh, for the elderly, for them uh, individually, for their families and caregivers, and for Medicare. Um, and uh, I'm really pleased with your comments about um, uh, costs uh, uh, and uh, prevention and about integrated care. Just wondering, what specifically do you see as some incentives to really encourage um, preventive early intervention uh, and a work around uh, such things as uh, depression and anxiety to really um, help the system and help individuals? We talked about the annual wellness visit, um, which is just one, uh, one area, but really if you think about it, this is a chance for a beneficiary to have a conversation with um, his or her physician really to go over not just the current medical needs, but the entire uh, uh, care picture for that beneficiary. One, one area is uh, the overall mental health of the patient. Does the patient um, need non-medical services that could benefit to keep them um, um, uh, healthier for longer periods of time to keep them in the community. But really what we're trying to promote throughout the Medicare program is this frequent conversation with the healthcare delivery system, be it behavioral health, be it, be it, be it medical intervention, be it just primary care checkup services, just because we know that when we can um, treat conditions early, when we can uh, prevent conditions early, um, that it works well for the Medicare program, but it work, a bit more important that it works better for beneficiaries. And, and, and our goal is to transition from a, a, a program that just pays for care when people are sick to paying for them before they become sick, before ill, to catch chronic conditions early to ensure that beneficiaries are treated better, but also that serves the long-term interests of the program. We probably have time for one final question. And so I don't know which, I think I'm gonna go over here just because I see more hands. Sorry, mm -hmm. folks. Um, so Carol, if we could find one more. I wanna make sure we give people on the panel time to respond. Hi, I'm Carol Peckham and I'm with Medscape, which is the sibling of WebMD. And uh, my colleague, Dr. Chang, I think had mentioned the problem with finding primary care physicians. And 
Um, I'm the editorial director of the, of the primary care sites at Medscape, and one of the major problems, I think, uh, facing the um, Accountable Care Act is the resentment of many of the physicians. Um, they feel that they're being overburdened, uh, and the main problem uh, with primary care is a uh, lack of reimbursement. And I, and I know this isn't really uh, your role, but I wonder if you could address the problem of primary care guys not being paid for cognitive uh, uh, cognition rather than and the, and most of the money going into the specialists uh, for, for procedures. Well, there are a couple things that the, the Affordable Care um, Act did uh, to, to address this issue. One is to provide higher payments, higher reimbursements for primary care physicians providing primary care services. Um, but when you think about the changes that we've been talking about, it really elevates and makes the primary care uh, physician and, and the primary care team sort of the um, quarterback of, of beneficiaries' um, health care through various changes like medical homes, but accountable care organizations, prevention, wellness, are really changing how we think about paying for care from just paying for when beneficiaries become sick to keeping them healthy, to keeping them you know, much more frequently tied to the physician's office. So uh, to my mind, you know, there are direct reimbursement increases, but more important is a change to how we organize the overall delivery care, putting primary care homes as sort of the centerpiece uh, to that care design, but to make sure the primary care physician, the primary care team is first and foremost uh, to how Medicare beneficiaries receive their care. Well, it's good news and bad news. Uh, we have more questions, but we can't answer them all. So um, we hope that you will uh, attempt to stay engaged with us so that we can make sure if you have a question that we need to answer that we, that we can or will. Uh, I do want to take a moment before we leave to thank the panelists that we've had a chance to meet today. Uh, Louise Chang with WebMD, and Sandy Markwood with the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, Jim Furman with the National Council on Aging, also the chair of the Leadership Council on Aging Organizations, my friend John Blum with CMS who gets lots of the Medicare questions, and Cecilia Munoz. And Cecilia, I didn't know if you had any uh, final comment uh, from the White House. We are so glad you were with us today from the Domestic Policy Council. Thank you so much, Kathy. I'd also like to add my thanks to all of the panelists and really to all of you for coming and, and being part of this event. Um, you know, this last question with respect to physicians and primary care physicians in particular uh, reminded me, we did an event like this uh, actually with physicians just about a week ago. Um, we're doing an event with nurses. We did an event focused on women. Um, and there's, this has been part of really a continual effort to make sure that we're focusing on every constituency with a stake in the Affordable Care Act. We've done that really throughout the process, really since before the law was passed. Um, and, and those efforts and the kinds of comments and questions that you have, I mean, I can't say strongly enough how much that informs our work uh, and how enormously valuable it is to us to make sure that we do the best possible job in moving this law forward to make sure that we're providing the protections that we intended to provide to people. This is an immense complex effort. And at the end of the day, the proof in the pudding is going to be in its impact on people's lives. Um, and so we just very much value and appreciate the time that you've um, spent to help inform us. Uh, we're going to keep that conversation going. We have a lot to do going forward. So really, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, if, for those of you here, if you could look at, if you picked up this little card before you came in, I wanted to just direct your attention and tell people kind of online what we're pointing to. Uh, these are the opportunities for you to stay connected and involved with us that you could go to Facebook at facebook.com, White House. White House has a Facebook page. You could follow us on Twitter, and the handles on Twitter are at White House or at hhs.gov. If you're interested in email updates, whitehouse.gov updates. And uh, Cecilia had mentioned the healthreform.gov website, which healthcare.gov has a lot of information on there about the Affordable Care Act as well as kind of individual uh, issues that can be more tailored to a specific person. So I would encourage you all to stay involved with us. And I would like to end where I began and talk about seniors themselves, that uh, one of the great honors uh, serving as Assistant Secretary for Aging is the, the opportunity to go talk directly to seniors. Seniors are their own best advocates. 
And for all of us who work on their behalf, I would just encourage us to stay connected to the seniors. Uh, they still have questions about the law. They still have uh, opportunities under the law to get their donor hole check or to get their preventive benefits. And it's important that we stay engaged with seniors so that they take advantage of all that we have uh, provided, really, through the Affordable Act, uh, Care Act for them. It's about their health. And uh, those of us know seniors that uh, what seniors want most is to stay healthy and stay independent, and this law can help them do both. So thank you all very much for coming this morning. It was wonderful to have you there.